October 1929, the US stock market crashed in the most catastrophic collapse in share prices of all time. The Wall Street crash set off a 10-year worldwide economic depression, the like of which had not been seen since the 19th century. In New Zealand, the effects were devastating. The security we had come to enjoy in the previous decade was shattered, and the Great Depression became a defining moment in our history. It destroyed deeply ingrained expectations about New Zealand as God's own country and left us with painful memories. I can remember going to the soup kitchen and getting soup, uh, billies of soup, um, and I think through the church, I think through the church, um, there were places you could go to get food like bread and, and porridge and things like that. Mm. Dad was a good shot, so he shot pukakas, and we had pukaka soup and rabbit stew and all those kind of things. And unless you had the sixpence in your hand, you couldn't buy anything. Contrary to what most people believed, the root cause of the Depression was outside our government's control. New Zealand's economy was, as ever, dependent on trade, and the dramatic collapse of overseas prices for wool, meat and dairy products ruined the economy. The warehouses of Britain, our chief market, filled with cheap products from other countries. Ours filled with products we couldn't sell. It's probably almost the worst we've ever had as a, as a, as a society, as an economy. Uh, unemployment was enormous. Soon after the Depression hit, our new Prime Minister, the uninspiring George Forbes, threw in the towel. A coalition was formed. Forbes remained Prime Minister, but Gordon Coates was effectively back in charge. The coalition faced huge problems. The first was how to pay back all that money we had borrowed from British banks. The government called together all the political parties to help find a solution. The massive borrowing of the 1920s for public works and those mortgages for happy homes had left the country with huge debts. There was a very real danger that as the depression squeezed Britain, its banks would call in the New Zealand loans. And the New Zealand government couldn't default because it depended on loans. The government also had to do something for the unemployed. But the measures weren't very successful. When the depression hit rock bottom in 1932, New Zealand's registered unemployment rate was 15%, far less than some other countries, but its social impact was felt everywhere. My father, who'd been in real estate business, lost his job. He was really, really mortally humiliated by being out of work. It was just something that he couldn't face. The government's ability to deal with unemployment was limited by a lack of money. But it was also driven by an ingrained belief that there should be no pay without work. At first, relief schemes were run by local councils. But the number of unemployed rose so fast that councils had to ration the work. They ran out of useful jobs and put men onto pointless tasks, sometimes in harsh, remote work camps. The men who were shunted into these back, back block areas, I mean, suffered a great deal, and these were, these actually provide, I think, the most traumatic and the most graphic images we have about the suffering of the unemployed during the slump and of the government's heartlessness. Soon after the Depression began, farmers' incomes sank to zero. The coalition saw that if something wasn't done, farmers could walk off the land the farming industry would collapse, and New Zealand would go with it. There were two or three farms taken over in the valley that uh, the people just had to run up bills, grocery bills, and they couldn't pay them, and in the end, they just had to give their farm away. Special laws were passed to allow farmers to defer payments, reduce their interest rates, or even to write off portions of their debt. 
The point here about the farmer policies, if farmers walked off the land, that was the end of the New Zealand economy. And that's why, that's why, apart from trying to service the overseas debt that it had, had incurred in the 1920s, why it did its best to try to maintain farmers on the land or trying to protect them. The measures worked. New Zealand farms were saved. Production rose almost every year of the Depression, and costs fell. Only a few farmers walked off the land. The government tried to pay back what it could by cutting its own expenditure. The wages of all government employees were cut. So many men were laid off from the Public Works Department that it almost disappeared. Even the official cats kept to catch mice had to make sacrifices. The practice in those days was to have official cats in government departments. And if you're running a paper-based operation, you don't want mice running all over the place. And there was an official allowance of milk for public service cats. And one of the economy measures adopted by the government of the day was to halve the allowance for milk for public service cats. Back in the 20s, Coates had been part of a government that had helped workers into happy homes with cheap mortgages. Now, he stood by as the unemployed had their homes sold up by their creditors. Evictions were often brutal and humiliating, like this one in Auckland's Grey Lynn. And losing the security of our happy homes would affect us for generations. Lawrence Baldwin kept losing friends in the street. People were shifting all the time, you know. Streets with uh, eight or ten houses empty uh, all the time in the, in the thir through the 30s, yeah. Mum and Dad got together and they bought an old tent, <laughs> poles. Dad got them out of the bush and we sat to and that was our home. We lived in a tent very often. We couldn't find a flat or a unit or anything like that. All different shapes, tents. Dad had put a wooden floor in them, so we were off the dampness. It was terrible. Yeah. I can remember once the grocer asking me, telling me that my mum couldn't have any more bread till we'd paid for some. Hmm. So that's how sticky it was. Hmm. I have to remember being very hungry many times. But we never went a day without food. We filled up with porridge in the morning and uh, we filled up again with rice pudding <laughs> in the evening. Māori received little state assistance and, as with the flu, were largely left to fend for themselves. The government was too busy dealing with its own uh, problems uh, facing world markets, the depression, uh, the fall in revenues from commodity, uh, in commodity prices, that the Māori was just, as far as they were concerned, irrelevant, left to the side to fend for their own selves. I was kind of born in the Depression years. Our household was an extended family of two grand aunts, a grand uncle, uh, an uncle and his wife and a child. You know, <laughs> and my father was supporting all these people, milking a few cows, and, and it was a wonderful time in a way, uh, growing vegetables, uh, harvesting time. People would come around and help, and they'd go away with bags of kumaraw potatoes and pumpkins and things like that catching eels, and the eels would be split, salted, uh, smoke-dried. The men would disappear up into the bush for a week at a time, uh, hunting wild pigs, shooting pigeons and coming back, and there would be a wonderful... You know, we never really starved during that time. Unexpectedly, perhaps, during the Depression, crimes of violence didn't go up. Theft did. So did suicide and people were driven to other desperate acts. Eric Jones, born during the Depression, was told of one such act later in life. Mum told me, when I was a mature man, a bit ashamed, I think, but I think she wanted to get off her conscience, that both Grandma and she twice tried to abort me. There was no money. And another mouth to feed was just simply too much. They were, they, they were desperate. So uh, that was what, presumably, that was the, yeah, that was the answer. 
and even nature added to the distress that New Zealand was suffering. In February 1931, an earthquake measuring 7.9 on the Richter scale hit Napier and Hawke's Bay. 256 people died. And still, the depression would have one more shock for us. The depression years had seen a rise in political activism. But until 1932, things had been largely non-violent. Then in the angry autumn of April and May of 1932, the despair of the unemployed turned to violence when rioting broke out in all the main centres. The first and most violent was in Auckland's Queen Street. An orderly protest against wage cuts became militant when it was joined by a group of relief workers. The peaceful march exploded into a riot on the steps of the Auckland Town Hall. Standing there, I think there was a bit of chanting and maybe a few speeches on the corner. Everybody could get up on the corner there. And then you could hear this surge of noise coming up Queen Street. You know, real angry noise. You know, you know. And then everything started flying. You know, you hear windows crashing in and things like that. Department store Smith & Coey was the only business on Queen Street that had taken out insurance against riot damage. The rioters came up and uh, they broke windows and looted and took charge of the street. And the police were ineffective to control it. And the plate glass windows in particular, 14 of those were broken. The country was appalled by the riots that uh, conditions had deteriorated to the extent that a riot needed to take place. In Wellington, relief workers rioted on Lambton Quay after a march on Parliament to meet Gordon Coates had brought no results. The next day, 2,000 people who couldn't get into a union meeting waited for speakers to come out and address them. When they did, the speakers were pulled down by police. The crowd threw rocks and the police charged them with batons. At the time, Ian Dixon was a student. I remember standing on the footpath in Willis Street in Wellington when, you know, one of these um, big, uh, angry parades was, was going on, and uh, the police drew their batons and just started flying round, and it was all terribly ugly, and the temporary police, which, which are some of my own student colleagues that uh, were doing the bashing, and, and that was very bad. Marg Jones' father was a communist who had spent 18 months in Russia. Her parents frequently took her on marches, and she has vivid memories of a protest at Palmerston North. The footpaths were crowded with people. And we were marching, and not many, about 200 people, I suppose, women and children. And we got nearly to the corner of the square, nearly to Broadway corner there, when from Cuba Street came these men on horses. Now, they were recruited. They were local farmers. So that, you know, there weren't horses that trained for this kind of crowd. And the horses lost it. And there was a lady there, she had a baby in her arms, and she was screaming, you see, she's holding the baby. The pushchair's on the footpath, she'd taken him out of the pushchair. And she lost the, the horse, she got a fright or something, and the baby rolled into the, down into the gutter. It wasn't hurt, but she's screaming her head off, you see. And the, the man on the horse, I can still see that man's face. He'd be about 40, fair hair, had a hat, helmet on thing on, and a baton thing in his hand. And he said, Jesus Christ, they're all bloody women and children. But the day wasn't finished for 12-year-old Marg. Her mother tried to help a unionist, and Marg treasures the picture of mum being bundled away by police. After the riots, the government tried to minimise political dissent by setting up work camps that were often in harsh and remote places. 
the camps were used very widely after the, particularly the Auckland riots. And it was often extremely unpleasant, you know, it was hard physical work and not everybody was suited to it. Uh, and and uh, I don't think people would tolerate it today, but, but in those days you just had no choice. Although many schemes were tough, some gave people a taste of adventure. One sent people gold mining. Len Moss remembers an unexpected benefit. When I became uh, Sony broke, we were sent over to the Wangapeka. That was for, supposed to be gold mining. I had a 303 at the time, and we used to go out shooting uh, deer, and we'd take a, a rump off the, a deer, and, and we used to feed very well, as a matter of fact. I finished up getting enough uh, gold for my wife's wedding ring. But the effect of the depression was uneven. Some people could still have holidays at the beach. And some towns came up with their own unusual ways of helping the unemployed. I ask you very confidentially, ain't he sweet? And this takes one back to wartime. Another case of a girl doing men's work. The depression hadn't been bad for everyone. If you kept your job, you enjoyed the fact that prices for most things went down. Sales of some products actually rose during the depression. Electrical goods, cars, and electricity use in homes all went up. The shops still had plenty for sale, and for those with money, prices were good. The depression was still hurting a lot of people, and they were looking for something to give them hope. Their old leaders seemed to have failed them, and people yearned for a new vision. Labour, although it had been standing for Parliament since 1916, had never got sufficient traction, really, to, to get a majority of seats. It, it had a good, solid vote, but it wasn't going to reach a majority. By now, though, the Labour Party had mellowed. It was decidedly less Marxist. It no longer wanted the state to own all the land. And what it did, which is very interesting, was the first, as it were, Marxist party or socialist party in the Western world, a mainstream one, which to all intents and purposes gave up, abandoned its commitment to socialism and instead, I mean, supported the whole idea of the ownership of, of private property. And this was a major, major turning point for Labour. A turning point that finally made it attractive to many New Zealanders. But its leader, Harry Holland, was still a liability, tainted by his militant and unappealing image. Critics in the party wanted to remove him, but he still had a strong personal following. Until fate took a hand. In October of 1933, the Māori King Turata Mahuta died. Holland attended his funeral. He arrived from Wellington with other dignitaries, including Aparana Ngata. But Holland felt ill. Ngata advised him not to climb Topuri Mountain with the funeral procession. But Holland ignored the advice. And soon after the burial, he suffered a heart attack and died. Holland's death uh, was really his major contribution to the Labour Party, which may sound unfair, uh, because he had been very important in their early days, but going at the moment he went was enormously important to the fortunes of the party over the next two years. Māori saw Holland's death as an omen, prophesying that this sacrifice would mean the success of Labour at the next election. For all New Zealanders, the Depression had been a turning point in our history. It had shattered our dreams of happy homes and made us fearful of risk and obsessed with security. Like many countries, we would throw out our old government and go down a different path that would produce a charismatic and revered leader and one of the most defining periods in our whole story.